Hi folks, welcome to your Jersey Immediate Post-Match Reaction Pod, coming to you in association with Forest Precision Engineering and our good friends at Football Prizes. My name's Alec Anderson and I'm speaking to you, well, an hour or so since I watched, I watched it uh, next door, I watched it in the comfort of my living room, sealing one foot through the plaster lock, the other foot up my ass, my chin on the floor, in these sockets, my big fat skull vacated up everything except the little ends of the dangly sinews that were holding two viscous orbs in front of my cheeks. What were those things? They they look like the kind of blood-stained castanets being held by a heartbroken fado singer in a Lisboa taverna. Are they blood-stained castanets? No, I think they're actually presents given to her in her honour by her bullfighter lover. Yes, folks, Rangers are back in the Iberian Peninsula, so it's going to be all about moi, moi, cojones. No, I don't mean moi, cojones, I mean ball, what I've seen, ball, eyeballs. My eyeballs saw Rangers draw 2-2 two -two with Benfica and Estadio de Luz. Lisboa Rangers drew 2-2 with Benfica in the Stadium of Light Lisbon. Rangers drew 2-2 in the first leg of the last 16 of the UEFA Europa League. God's own football tournament, our own football tournament. Rangers drawing 2-2 with Benfica. The second club ever to be champions of Europe. Benfica, the second club ever to retain the European Cup of Champions League. Uh, Benfica, the second club ever to reach three successive finals of the European Cup or the Champions League. They've reached ten European finals in all. Not just a colossal footballing institution in Portugal, but a colossal football sporting institution in the Iberian Peninsula, in Europe, and planet Earth. The, the Portuguese diaspora is absolutely colossal. The three, four times the size of anything you'll get in Scotland. They've got fans in the USA, they've got fans in the UAE, but we are Rangers, so have we. It was a battle of football and royalty. It was a clash of soccer aristocracy. Rangers took it to Benfica tonight. We said, there's the fucking line. I dare you to cross it, Benfica. You take a chunk out of us, we will take a chunk out of you. A performance of phenomenal tactical acuity, a mental fortitude, physical prowess. Wasn't all smooth, wasn't all plain sailing. Rangers uh, really executed poorly at the time. We had some bad mistakes, but that was just a facility. That was just a, a function of us going for it properly. We had to make up for the fact that they've got 100 trillion more pounds than us uh, and their players invested in their playing squad. They absolutely zero injuries. I think we've got one player with a hangnail. We've got players dropping like flies uh, in our squad. And also, as the manager was saying yesterday in his pre-match presser, Benfica have never lost at home in the Europa League. I, he was, he was saying we have to be realistic. He's holding that up as reasons why we shouldn't expect too much. But what he really meant was that's what we're going for. They've never been beaten at home in the Europa League. I fancy a bit of that. No wonder we played so poorly against Motherwell. I now understand what happened last Saturday. It wasn't just the players that had one foot on the plane to Lisbon, as people were saying. The manager... <laughs> And the feet on the plane to Lisbon as well. He was so up for it. Have you seen the Revenant? We're talking about bears. We're talking about eagles. The eagle has landed. Even I was saying that yesterday. Well, the parts of Hamilton bus landed in the tunnel outside the Stadium of Light. You saw it at half time in the coverage of the Sparta Prague Liverpool game. The players, the bears turning up to fire in to the eagle's nest. Every chunk you take out of us, we will take a chunk out of you. Claw to claw, talent to talent, whatever you want to call it. Rangers went in there, went toe to toe, punch, counter punch, and we said the only way to do this is to get rattled into them, to fire into them. Have you seen The Revenant, the bear, the bear attacks? Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, fantastic film. Uh, the Tom Hardy character, is his name O'Leary or something like that? But he's been scalped. At the beginning, all through the, the the beginning of the film, towards the end of the film, he's, he was scalped earlier on in his life. He got attacked by natives and he suddenly must have fought them off eventually. But he's kind of half scalped. So he's got half of his scalp left and the rest of it gets taken off. And we keep half scalping Benfica. This is the second time in four seasons that we've been to the Stadium of Light and constantly take the lead. And they keep equalising. We came so close. We've half scalped them two times on their own patch. But this is... The, what, fifth time Rangers have been to Lisbon on European duty. We've only lost once. And the one time we lost in Lisbon, we scored a minimum of two goals, minimum achieved tonight. We scored a maximum of three goals across all those five ties uh, in Lisbon. And the only time we've lost in Lisbon was the, the time that we actually progressed all the way to the final and won the thing. The only time Rangers have won a European tournament, the only match they lost en route to winning that European tournament was in Lisbon. So maybe we've made a mistake tonight. Maybe it was a, a total cock-up. We should have let them get another goal and we could have actually won this season's Europa League. What a, 
what a game, folks. What a night. <laughs> Superb. Rangers, um, let's... How did things go uh, tactically? How did things go with the squad? Yesterday, I was saying how I find... The, the 11 that we started with tonight was absolutely what I predicted yesterday, what I wanted us uh, to start with, except I would have dropped uh, Dujon Sterling. I would have had Ross McCausland on the right-hand side. So that's why Dujon Sterling was absolutely magnificent and scored, just to prove me completely wrong. We went with Jack Butland in goals. We had Red Van Yelmaz at left-back, uh, captain, fantastic Tav at right-back, Connor Goldson... And John Souter becoming a bit of a, a partnership at centre half. You had a um, do do John Lundstrom and Diamondi sitting again. Diamondi get pushed up to the ten. Um, you hear me talking last night in the preview pod. It went on far too long because I was far too excited about this game. Uh, Diamondi get pushed up to ten on Saturday. That disrupted things. He's been doing quite well sitting in beside John Lundstrom in the sitting two midfield. So he was back to that tonight, and we had. Um, <laughs> Fabio Silva back at a club he played for at youth level, quite keen to prove himself uh, to his home nation tonight. I think Fabio Silva to his compatriots, and he was playing on the left hand side of the attack in three. We had uh, Dujon Sterling out on the right hand side, utility man William the Fridge Perry Sterling, absolutely fantastic, could do a job for you anywhere. And it was Cyril Dessers up front at number 10. We had Tom Sailing. Takes me away to where I'm going. Lawrence, uh, he's in there at number 10 tonight because he can't start every game just now. He's still coming back from injury. We were all set up and uh, we knew that if we got past the one minute mark without conceding a goal, we'd done better already than we did the last time we played at this stadium, the first time we played at this stadium, three and a half years ago. Yeah, because remember Connor Golson scored an own goal that night. <laughs> I mean, Connor Golson scored an own goal. He uh, scored a goal for Benfica in the stadium. Like, hilarious stuff. That's never going to happen again. So we got to one minute and one second, and I was uh, quickly on Twitter because I'm a bit of a wit. You know what I'm like. I was saying, well, that's us done better than we did the last time over here. Uh, but we did take centre tonight. We kicked off tonight, and Benfica were on top of us straight away. They were in our box within the first minute of the game kicking off. Jack Butland that saved down to his uh, near post four minutes into the game. They had a cracking double save uh, in 14 minutes. Looked like Benfica were in on goal. They're definitely going to score. In between times, we took the lead. Of course we did because it's the Europa League. It's Rangers. We took the lead. And it summed up our attitude tonight. The goal summed up our attitude, which seemed to be Benfica are going to crowd this midfield. The, the, the kind of diamond formation, the kind of compressed. You've got four players in the middle just outside of our box. They've got guys going wide, overlapping fullbacks and all that kind of stuff. It's going to be all out attack. So we need to bypass that. We're just going to fire the ball fast and hard and accurately across long distances. It's that thing where it gets almost kind of talked down. It's pejoratively expressed as Philip Clement's Rangers are very direct. But you can only be that direct if you are super bloody accurate. And that kind of accuracy over that kind of distance at that kind of speed takes a lot of skill. Not a flashy skill that sees you hanging about um, on the wings, dribbling past three or four guys, then having to go past them again. It's fast, it's hard. And the, the, the skill are really, really minute. It's, the devil really is in the detail. And it, it's fantastic to watch it when Rangers play that way, as we did tonight. Total energy, total commitment. The players seemed psyched. The manager has obviously got them psyched, but this tournament has them psyched as well. This group of players, there's a core in there who has been there, seen it, done it in the Europa League eh, under Steven Gerrard, under Giovanni Van Bronckhorst, a little bit under Michael Beale, and now under Philip Clement himself, I think, in nosebleed territory. I don't think he's ever been in the last 16. He usually goes out in the round of 32 with Genk and with, with Bruges and with Monaco. I think he's going out in the, the, the playoff round of 32 in the Europa League. But he knew what he was doing tonight. He wanted it. He wanted to finally properly scalp Benfica on their own turf. He was raging when it didn't happen. But that's the kind of commitment that you need if you're going to even, I think, get a draw when there's this disparity between the teams in terms of the talent they've got on paper, the, the amount of money they've got invested in their, in their uh, relative squads. I love this story, I'm, I'm going to take a breather because I absolutely loved it. We scored, didn't we? I've even got down to how we scored the goal. Aye, so uh, uh, John Suter, there's a, a ball knocked up and he seemed to just come out of nowhere, John Suter. And suddenly he was running about the halfway line and he nods this ball down really fiercely directly to uh, Diamondi, who's got his back to goal. He's kind of halfway along the um, 
the Benfica half of the field. And I remember at the time when he controlled it, it was on his chest, kind of over towards his arm. What about his Oaksters, as we say, in the Ivory Coast? And I thought to myself, oh God, if this goes to VAR, if, it, if we actually score a goal for this move, I better remember not to get too excited because it might go to VAR. Well, two seconds later, it's in the back of the net and I completely forgot about it. You don't get excited about goals now because of VAR. No, you get excited twice. You try not getting excited when Rangers score a goal like that, when Rangers put the ball in the back of the net in the Stadium of Light against Benfica after a mere seven minutes. Um, Dean Lundy gets the ball, he turns, he works a fabulous one too with Fabio Silva, an extended one too that sees Dean Lundy getting the ball back and taking it to the byline in the left hand side and I've been watching Benfica, I've watched uh, their highlights, so have you uh, you saw the five goals, they lost to Porto at the weekend I was watching all their Champions League group stage goals that they were conceding, it's the back post it's the back post, hit the back post and the managers obviously drilled that into the Rangers players tonight Diamondi fires it over. Sterling is going for the front post. Um, Dessers is at the back post. But Diamondi hits the the edge, the six yard box almost, just to back oh, kind of maybe penalty spot, but it's towards the back post area. And they're arriving uh, gracefully as ever, like a swan. Never mind an eagle, a swan gliding through the air as Tom sailing takes me away to where I'm going. <laughs> Lawrence, I don't know the words of that song I don't think anybody knows the words of that song But Tom Lawrence is so smooth He's like you're listening to Yacht Rock On a yacht that is actually rocking gently On a wave, he's graceful He's equilibrium To, to, to the opposition, he's fire, he's ice he's a, he's a real pain, he's a destroyer But to us, the way he glides is like a swan You see him just gliding across the surface You know there's so much work going on behind that He's kind of enigmatic as well Because he hasn't played as many games as we want him to I hate the fact that he's born in Wrexham And played for Cardiff So probably the last thing he wants to be nicknamed Is the swan But Tom Sailing Takes me away To where I'm going <laughs> Should be nicknamed the Swan because he moves like a swan and he leapt up onto that ball from Diamondi like a swan and he just nodded it down with his big mute neck into the bottom of the net. Rangers are winning against Benfica in the stadium. Benfica took the lead the last time we played them here, so that was a nice speed change. But of course we are, of course we are. It's the it's the Europa League. Rangers last two games. Have I mentioned this already? Because I'm going to keep mentioning it up until probably the second leg that Rangers' last two games in Europe have been a 3-2 win in the Benito Villa Marin against Real Betis and a 2 each draw with Benfica. That's the name I don't know if I mentioned that. It's Benfica that we played tonight. We drew two each with them in uh, the Stadium of Light. Not the Stadium of Light that Michael Beale was sacked from, the real Stadium of Light. Not even the original Stadium of Light. It was slightly to the left of the Stadium of Light we're in tonight. It held twice as many people as this beautiful spaceship of a stadium we were playing in tonight. A kind of Emirates on... It's only holds about 5,000 more than the Emirates, so it's no steroids. It's an Emirates on acid, really. Um, I can add, I reduced a bit fancier Azteca. It's, it's got the, see, the, when it's empty, it's got the Coca-Cola through the seats. That's very Latin, very Latin American almost. Um, of course, the, the Mexicans, big influence from uh, Europe. And, you know, I, I know it's more Brazil now than it's Portugal. But, aye, it's what a stadium, what a venue, iconic venue. Euro 2004 final, the 2014 Champions League final, the first ever final between two teams from the same city, uh, Real Madrid against Atletico Madrid. And Real Madrid winning La Decima there. The 10th, the first team to get into double figures with European Cups, Champions Leagues. The the, the COVID season, they had the tournament. I've mentioned all this in the preview pod last night, but Bayern beat PSG in the 2020 uh, Champions League final in, in this stadium. Portuguese national team played plenty of games there as well. It's, it's, it's a major stadium, it's a major venue, and the Rangers were out there just giving it, well, we play in a major stadium, we play in a major venue, we will rock this fucking place. We were absolutely sorry, I shouldn't be swearing so much, but we were fantastic. Um, or one nothing up, and they've got a guy called Angle de Maria that plays for them at Benfica, and Vidvan Yilmaz is now on, I think, the Calvin Bassey fast track in his second season. He's, he's just... Since he made a pass inside in the first five minutes against Kilmarnock in the 2nd of January that went wrong, that went straight to an opposition player and I slagged him out loud. One of the first times I've slagged a Rangers player out loud at Ibrox. I, I, don't, I slagged him not in, in the privacy of my own home, but in the same, breathing the same air as them. I never do that, but I just, ah, oh, Redvan. And that was him. He's been brilliant ever since then. And he took it up a notch tonight. I'm not going to say for a wee man he's got really big pockets because Angel Di Maria set up both 
Well, he scored one and, and uh, he made one and scored the first equaliser and he uh, set up the second equaliser for them tonight as well. Uh, but the guy scored in the World Cup final a mere 15 months ago. Angle de Maria he won the World Cup, as did Nicola Otamendi, their captain. Nicolas Otamendi is playing uh, centre-half for them tonight. He got sent off the last time we played them, three and a half years ago. Sent off in the Stadium of Light in the three-each draw we had with Benfica that night. But uh, he lasted the pace tonight. But he was making sure, uh, trying to make sure that not all our players would. He went in there really cowardly. We're talking about Tom Sailing. Takes me away, you know where I'm going. <laughs> Lawrence being the swan, but he did the kind of dying swan act, Otamendi, when uh, young young Sterling went in there and kind of just made basic contact with him. So Dujon Sterling's on a booking straight away, and I'm thinking maybe the manager's going to have to take him off before half time, you know, just so he doesn't get a second yellow card. Calling it again, Alec, football tactician extraordinaire I am. So uh, they were doing that thing, they were getting really textured around that half hour mark, it was, it was kind of tactical tetchiness from very experienced Benfica players, they're very cheaty, very divey, very, very kind of slap you in the back of the head type stuff, but Yilmaz was rattling Di Maria, Di Maria wasn't, wasn't appreciating the fact this young guy was kind of back pocketing them for large spells of the game. They're slippery. They're so that the, their movement was so fantastic. Benfica corner after corner after corner. Rangers. It was real Alamo stuff with every corner. Some of the corners were overhit though. Some of the crosses <clears throat> throughout the whole game were overhit, and Rangers were just getting enough on the ball, getting enough on the tackles, and all the areas of the park. Diamondi and um, Lundstrom were absolutely fantastic in that sitting too in the first half in particular. Ran out of steam a bit in the second half, but in the first half they were absolutely phenomenal. Just putting an awful wind right up this team that they couldn't settle ben Benfica. So when we scored against them tonight, we took the lead against them. That's them conceded six straight goals without reply. <laughs> so their fans were not happy. It started a bit of booing, then the rain come on. And generally, generally, it was a bad mood. We were Motherwell tonight. We were Motherwell on Saturday. That's what we were tonight to, to Benfica. Um, and even have the same amount of play, opening the, the score and what have you, basically being under pressure but determined, you know, we nearly, we nearly pulled it off, we nearly won 2-1 as well. Uh, absolutely tremendous performance, I've got to stop saying absolutely fantastic, absolutely tremendous, but it's difficult when it was. <laughs> uh, out we go, we're one nothing up as I say, uh, Benfica started trying to annoy us, trying to get uh, folks sent off and what have you, and then it's Dessers has a moment where he should control, he should do much better with the ball up front and it leads to, was that a foul or something? It, it le basically, long, long story short, it's a corner to Benfica. Otamendi puts it in and John Suter, if you're a Rangers supporter, you're saying he's heading it onto his own hand. So it's, he's heading it onto, he's contacting another part of his body then onto his hand. So it's not a penalty, but it goes to VAR. Um, from behind the goal, you, you're seeing the referee going to the monitor, looking at it, constant replays. From behind, he's wearing the big white Under Armour thing. There's no help, it's really exaggerating his sleeve, his arm movement. Um, so the ball's going, the ball is going from his head onto his hand. And it looks like the hand is more, it's a deliberate action from behind. The, the the photos, the footage from in front of him uh, showing the front of his big kind of agricultural red-cheeked face. It looked pretty much like, ah, he's, he's heading the ball. He's deliberately heading the ball and it just happens to be onto his hand. But the referee took the view that it was handball uh, and it was a penalty and upstepped Angle de Maria to stroke it past Jack Butland who did a, a, a bit of kind of histrionics, a bit of fanning about on the line. He got himself booked. I'm quite liking this from Jack Butland although it hasn't worked yet. He did it at Kilmarnock the other week as well. He's, he's, he's up to stuff. He's got wee techniques uh, but he's yet to save a penalty. <laughs> but uh, he's, he's feeling confident. Anyway, De Maria, he scored penalties for their only goals that they scored against Toulouse in the last round when we were sitting just watching who was going to come through the playoff round of this uh, season's tournament. Benfica were in there and they were playing against Toulouse. Mid-table, league on. They beat them 2-1. Uh, but the second penalty scored, it was both penalties by De Maria in the first leg at the Stadium of Light. And the second one he scored was seven and a half minutes into injury time. So quite quite lucky to get through in that tie. But uh, Di Maria scoring the penalties. He does the old guys come in Jetta thing of looking at the goal and just taking the one step. But they accept that uh, well, guys come in Jetta looked like, uh, I don't know, kind of Julio Iglesias style uh, to be stereotyping. He, you know, very well dressed, looking a bit of a lounge singer. Angle Di Maria looks like he's in uh, the, 
Manus Silva Street. What's it, Manus? MS 13, anyway, Manus Silva Street. Yeah, kind of prison gang type tattoos and very skinny and all that. Kind of scary looking dude, despite having absolutely zero body fat on him. But he strokes the penalty away, and that's it. It's one each, and it's 45 minutes, and you're thinking, ah, damn, if only we could have lasted to half time. Maybe we should still get Sterling off, thinks Alec. And then Rangers score again. And of course, it's, it's Sterling that scores before half time, and that was major to take it back to Benfica to say, right, you, you've equalised against us. You think there's going to be any kind of deluge? Well, we're going to make sure we get another goal on board just to offset that. And we did it straight away, and it showed the, the moi moi cojones that we weren't going to we weren't going to be bullied um, at all in this game. Again, another lovely moment. The captain Tav he goes over to the left hand side. Tav was terrible on Saturday against Motherwell, but he was not to blame for Motherwell's winning goal. There was about three different guys uh, that weren't getting picked up in that box and Tav is just doing that thing of being blamed because he's nearest the guy who eventually scores just because he's getting there to try and do whatever he can. It happens a lot with, with James Tavernier. Uh, he was terrible in his distribution and he did give the ball away in defensive areas, certainly in the first half. Uh, but he was not to blame for the, the, the winning goal. That was uh, I, I don't think that was, that, that was right. Um, I heard folk blaming him for that. I read people blaming him for that as well on Twitter and I thought, no, no. But I was really happy for him tonight, James Tavernier, because he had some fantastic defensive moments as as much as anything else. But of course, he also has to be involved in a Rangers goal. And he scored, he set up the Benfica own goal the first time we played here. And we drew three each in the 2020-2021 season. But tonight he takes a free kick, um, right-footed from the left-hand side. Connor Golson goes up with their goalkeeper, who's looks like kind of a dated Lewis Ferguson. He takes out Connor Golson, wipes him out, but while he's on the deck, Tav comes right in there for the ball coming back out. Second ball on it like a shot, feeds it to Fabio Silva uh, in that inside left channel. Silva pulls it back across the goal, They're kind of going for the back post. Uh, Dessel's kind of misses it, I think it hits off, it deflects off a Benfica player. But in comes Sterling at the back post to just slot it home super calmly. There's a VAR check, and again, you get to celebrate the goal twice. <laughs> it really is. VAR gives you value for money. Oh, it, it, we're winning 2-1. We're winning 2-1 against Benfica in the Stadium of Light, and it's just standard. It's Rangers in the Europa League. We come out in the second half, and we definitely did start to wilt. The energy wasn't there. They'd obviously, given it everything they could in the first half just to get to that point where they were really getting under Benfica's skin, kind of, you know, making sure they, they, they weren't going to be getting into any kind of flow and taking out on us, what they've been suffering domestically in the past two games. Uh, but eventually, what was it, yeah, 60, how can I forget, it was 67 minutes. We're in Lisbon, 67. Um, again, Dessers is getting it a bit tight from Ali McCoy's post-match and the analysis. Ali doesn't like Rangers strikers, does he? I don't know why. Yeah, I can't imagine why. But he, his record was broken, his European record for Rangers was broken in this stadium the last time we played Benfica. So many things happened the last time we played them by a certain Alfredo Morelos. But uh, Dessers, I think it was a bit harsh. It, it was a ball he could have won up front, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a total gimme. Anyway, before, because he doesn't win it, Benfica come at us through the middle and they just basically walked right through Diamonde and Lundstrom, who weren't doing anything wrong. They just are super skillful. This Benfica team. Why have they got a guy that wears number 87 jersey though? The guy who wears number 87, the wee Wrigley character that was playing on the kind of right hand side. Is it Neves? Or he, 87, is, that's like a Rangers player wearing 67. 87 is the year that Porto became the second team to win the European Cup. The second Portuguese team to win the European Cup. Up until that point, it had only been Benfica. And Porto have now got uh, two European Cup slash Champions League. But uh, they won it in 87. Maybe they were commemorating the. Uh, that same year, they had the, the record European crowd for a domestic league match, 130 odd thousand at the original Stadium of Light. But that year, Porto won the European Cup. So it's a weird one. But yeah, they ends up, we have to foul them uh, towards the edge of our box. De Maria plays the ball into our box. And all night, I think we've given it so much energy. We were so sharp, so psyched up that when they're getting tired and Rangers players at Lundstrom started giving the ball away, there's a lot of us giving the ball away at this point in time and the manager can't make the substitutions around about half time, the hour mark, because they just don't have the depth of squad just now with all the injuries. I think that when you become physically tired, that means you're mentally tired. You've got the kind of memory of what it is to be psyched up, but that just becomes a general panic almost. We've been marshalling the ball, we've scoping the ball out every time Benfica overhit it and they did it a lot in this game. 
Uh, Jack Butland's super cool, but I don't know if he's not bothered giving a shout or what, because it's so obvious there's no Benfica players anywhere near uh, the ball as it comes in, but Connor goes and just turns heads it straight into the top corner, basically. So that's him scored at both ends of the Stadium of Light for Benfica uh, against Rangers, has Connor Goldson. thing to note is that when we played at Benfica three seasons ago, James Tavernier scored in the Ibrox game. He scored an own goal. He scored for Benfica, so maybe get your money on Tav next week if you're a gambling person. And to score next Thursday night for the opposition. And that was it. It was uh, two weeks, and you're thinking, is there going to be a deluge? Are they going to start hammering us? Plenty of time to go in the game. The manager did start making substitutions, though, just after the kind of 70 minute mark, and they worked. A young Cole McKinnon comes on, uh, but we had uh, Ryan Jack coming into midfield in place of. Uh, Rodia Bondi pushed up so Tom Sailey takes me away to where I'm going <laughs> Lawrence he come off uh, at that point in time definitely earned his rest like I said Ross McCausland would come on later on in the game on the left hand side for Silva Silva did really well he was fantastic tonight but he was really keen on doing the no look passes and I think it's just ostentation, the no-look pass. I don't think it's fooling your opponent, especially Portuguese uh, opponents. And not that all the Benfica players were Portuguese. But I think it's actually confusing him. It was just, he was really trying to make a point of how well he was doing uh, back in his homeland. I don't think there was any need for it, but all in all, he made a fantastic contribution tonight. Uh, did Fabio Silva really, really worked his shift. And uh, Roof come on, Roof come on for Dessers and instantly started winning his shies and was winning his yardage. He's just brilliant, Kamar Roof. If he could play all the time, if he wasn't injured all the time, he would never be at Rangers because he's just class when he does actually play for us. And one tonight was one of those nights that we really needed him. That's the second. He come on, oh, he come on <laughs> in Seville and scored the winner, our first ever winner against Spanish opposition in Spain. And then the following Sunday, come on in the League Cup final when we're trying to run down the clock in that one and started doing that masterfully as well. So just wee things like that. It's not even it's not all about goal scoring even the way he's running down the clock in these vital games. We might lose. You're not getting any points tonight. We're not in the groups stage anymore, we're deep in the tournament again, we get out the group stage, unlike anybody else in Scotland, we get out the group stage the right way, and we go through into the, the latter knockout stages, we're not getting points for this tonight, and I think it's such a finely balanced tie, but it's that way, if we push it too far in any way, next Thursday, as we're likely to do, we are a big massive crowd, having paid £46 a head <laughs> for this stadium, and having to you know, get away for their work early, they'll rip us to pieces. We could end up losing this game 3 or 4 nothing next week, or it could go to penalties. Rangers and Benfica, there's never a winner uh, when, we, when we meet competitively in three games so far. But uh, I, I'm just enjoying the fact that we've taken it that stage further again. We're representing them, we're representing ourselves and to go to this iconic venue against this iconic club and show that well, we belong. It was absolutely fantastic. And we made these substitutions. We saw time out. I wasn't really expecting us to score again. I wasn't really expecting Benfica to score again either. And it was just great. It's just phenomenal. We've got a draw. We're still, you know, this tie is just basically starting again next Thursday. Ibrox, it's going to be an amazing atmosphere um, for the first time Benfica have ever played in front of an Ibrox crowd competitively. We beat them in that friendly, I was talking about this in the preview pod, 3-0 in 1948 in the Stadio Nacional, and we beat them 3-1 in the 1966 friendly at Ibrox in the 60s, in the middle of the, the decade that uh, Benfica reached five finals of the European Cup. We blew them away at Ibrox as well, so Benfica have never beaten Rangers, unless we've played them in other friendlies that I don't know about, but that would mean me going, in, going in to, to open up the, the complete Rangers, McElroy and Farriers, the Farriers, the complete Rangers, and once you open that up, you never get back out. You know, there's, there's a day gone, so I can't risk that, but you can tell me if you know about a time that Benfica have beaten us in friendlies, but so far I don't think they've beaten us at all, and it would just like the thing if the one time they do, it's on penalties or something like that, to put us out of Europe, but uh, we've just gave a great account of ourselves tonight, and it's the the Europa, Europa League, I covet it, I love it, it's <laughs> it's like a blanket, it, it just, you throw it over yourself and it's it, it's not too warm, uh, it's not coming up over, uh, over your feet, exposing your feet, it's not, you know, smuffocating you by being too hard over your head or whatever, it's not, you're not taking a, a day off, you're working, you're hiding under this blanket because you're taking a, a sickie, you're depressed, it's a day off, you know, you've had a wee drink night before but you're not totally hung over, you're just buzzing and chilled, it's just, snuggle, comfort, it's, uh, I love the Europa League and 
I've worked out why, and I worked out a few things about me when it comes to European football. I thought it was a, a xenophile. No, it's not the worst file you can be, but it's every bit as, as bigoted as being a xenophobe because you're saying that everything foreign is great. And that's, you know, Hamas, Donald Trump, Victor Orban. Everything foreign isn't great. Um, things aren't great just because they're foreign. They can still be interesting even if they're horrible. But I used to take this position that I was more interested in you. I'm more interested in you because my 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 mum's Catholic, my dad's Protestant, and uh, my sister and I were never we were never baptized in any faith. They weren't very churchy. So yeah, I think that made more of a kind of free thinker, you know, more kind of open minded. Yeah, and I get into European football. You no, know, I so what happened, I was just I was leaving school early to work any kind of job I could find so I could go and get bevied every weekend while watching Rangers. Uh, Eastern Road, Tynecastle, Patoja. I would just go all over the country watching Rangers. It was the most exotic thing. I mean, I wasn't doing that. I'd be watching the Russian Winter Rovers. But somehow, I was actually a European traveller in my mind because I was buying books, encyclopedias about European football. I was taping Ken McRobb's European Roundup of uh, Scott Sport, you know. And ever since I had you know, Betamax uh, video recorders, VHS video recorders, I would record European finals every season, the European finals. I wasn't old enough to remember Rangers winning the Cup winners Cup. I was only two at the time. That passed me by. The first time I remember Rangers in Europe, the first season I clearly remember, was my dad getting me out of my bed to watch the sports scene highlights of a beaten Juventus in the second leg. Uh, the first round of the 78-79 European Cup. Ali McDonald scoring into Brimland Road End against Juventus, the same as he scored against Torino. Uh, in the Cup Winners' Cup, and we put him at the Cup Winners' Cup quarter-final in 71-72, is Ali McDonald the only guy to put out both Turin clubs from European competition with goals into the very same goal, uh, the very same net? I don't know. That's a, 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 a trivia question you can ask yourself. I've certainly brought it up uh, every year for the last four years on you, hasn't it? But that was the first European tournament I remember. Um, we got you know, a quarter-final and out we went to Cologne. But after that, it was kind of most of the 70s, after they won the Cup Winners' Cup, we were, we were banned for a, a season. And uh, most of the 80s, and I was growing up and all that, Rangers were ranking Europe, never really did anything at all. Uh, if you got back then, you know, David Murray comes in after Lawrence Marlborough had come in, we start the money, we start becoming players. Uh, big players in the European stage. We help, you know, kind of form the Champions League. We're a goal away from the final, 92-93, in the following season. Bang. That's us. We're straight out in the first round uh, against uh, Levski Sofia. Next season, bang, straight out the first time of asking against Ike Athens. It's almost, almost like punishment. You've got beyond, the Rangers that I grew up with had almost got beyond themselves. They'd, they'd got cocky by getting to a goal away from the Champions League final. Um, and all these I'd been I'd grown, I was reading about Wolves hosting Hornved and Spartak Moscow in the fifties under the lights of part of the the many reasons for European club competition as they currently know it being established in the mid fifties. I found all this kind of fascinating. It made me more interested than you. I would look into all this kind of stuff. I was recording all these European finals, and I was just praying that Rangers would finally one day go all the way, and I could get to be all foreign and continental and, and more interesting in my Scottish confines. And. Uh, it didn't really happen. Again, it was another nine years before Rangers got past Christmas in in Europe. You know, the PSG game under Dick Advocat, his last kind of gift to us before he left. And again, it was almost like you had to spend a decade paying for the fact we'd done so well in that first ever Champions League tournament. And then, you know, we end up, you know, through the next decade, we're getting into the Champions League group stages a bit more regularly. We've got more money and... Well, Alec McLeish, we get through the group stage, we get into the last 16, and I was there, I went over to Villarreal, home and away, I was travelling in Europe at that point, eh, following Rangers, fantastic experience, but that was as far as we got, and then Walter comes in, we get to the UEFA Cup final, I'd already been, I'd, it was almost like I'd been to the Champions League final at Hamden, I'd attended the last ever Cup Winners Cup final down at Villa Park, and I went to the UEFA Cup final that was staged at Hamden in 2007 between Espanyol and Sevilla, and it was almost like I'd paid my dues, I'd seen all the European club finals, there you go Alec, finally you can get to see your club in it, I'm at Manchester, I'm at the City of Manchester Stadium the following season, I'm seeing Rangers in a European final, I can die happy, I've achieved, and it was really funny, I realised the following season, it was uh, Shakhtar Donetsk, shout out to the people of Donetsk, uh, what they're going through right now. Shakhtar Donetsk beating uh, Werder Bremen in Istanbul in the last ever UEFA Cup final before it rebranded as Europa League. And I recorded it again, or tabled it, whatever I was doing at the time, but I just I wasn't really that interested. I wasn't, it wasn't even lighting my fire, and I bet I may have been sated. I wasn't even maybe that much of a xenophile. It was just about Rangers, was it? Just about seeing Rangers achieving in Europe. Mm, I'll park that. I don't really want to consider that too deeply. Uh, because I'd, a lot of my life was based on 
you know, watching European football or my party trick is naming all the teams that have played in the three European finals. Big hit with ladies, the ladies, that one. Uh, so I didn't want to think too deeply about it. And then, of course, you know, a few years later, we have slight financial problems and suddenly we're demoted and suddenly we're in the bottom tier of Scottish football and suddenly I don't give a shit about European football. I don't give a monk a rat's ass about European club football. Uh, I'm only interested in East Fife, East Stirlingshire. I'm only interested in Peterhead, Queen's Park. That's all I want to do. I mean, I'm still paying attention to like, Celtic results, hoping they get beat. But it's amazing how this, I just circle the wagons and I started realising, do you know what it is? I don't actually think I am an open-minded, exotic, interesting person. I think the only reason I was so interested in European football was for the most basic, myopic, internecine, bigoted, you know, football bigoted reasons you can possibly get, is that our biggest rivals, our derby rivals, have won the European Cup, and we haven't. That's what it was, I suddenly realised that's what it was all about. And then the Europa League happened. We qualified for Europe. I'm sorry to go on about this, but it's a, it's a significant night, this. We've got to enjoy it. Um, remember, we qualified at Fur Hill. We, we, we beat Partick Thistle with a last minute goal. It was a Sunday at Fur Hill, just up the road from me, but I wasn't there. I was watching it on telly. Celtic fans, why are they all invading the pitch to celebrate a goal against Partick Thistle? Why are they celebrating just qualifying for Europe? You know, five years later, why are they celebrating uh, losing a European final in Seville on penalties, whereas we turned losing a European uh, final in Seville after extra time into the greatest achievement by any club on earth? <laughs> he started getting the message. Uh, this is something we had to do. The Europa League was made for us and we were meant for it. I don't, I don't for a second um, subscribe to this. It it's started to kind of, on Rangers Twitter, it's been, I think the, the Europa League's actually better than the Champions League. They'll say, oh, I meant it's more interesting. And it isn't, because the most interesting thing in football should be the best team. Should be watching the best football. In Manchester City, you should be watching them every day of the week. Because despite where their money comes from and all that, if you're interested in football, they are the best in the world right now. So uh, the Champions League, it might be the same teams. It might be a cartel, uh, kind of eight or nine teams that are always going to be thereabouts these days. But even that changes within itself but it's still the best football and that should always be the most interesting thing but it is interesting if you're just looking at it the way I looked at it in my thinking of my NFL days oh, I want to see as many different clubs you know, with good supports and decent histories as possible so it's always more varied in the Europa League it's more interesting before you look at the actual standard of football neutrals tonight would probably have thought this is two bad teams but you're invested in it you know who we're playing against it was, it was exciting as hell that game tonight they're really proud of the Rangers, they, they, they really went at it. But I just, uh, Stephen Gerrard comes in as man, we're so excited to qualify for Europe and we end up getting put out by Progress Nidicon under Pedro. And it's the most, we qualify for Europe finally, that's the big aim. Uh, and all the years we're in the, the lower leagues and it turns into the biggest humiliation ever. But the other thing I realised was when we're in the, 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 the very bottom division, our first season uh, after being demoted, remember we got Motherwell in the League Cup? Around about September time, we'd played about three rounds, which was a new thing for us to get to that stage. But we got Motherwell in the League Cup around about September, and they were top of the top flight at the time, temporarily as it was. And we played them, and it was it was it felt like a European game. It felt like a kind of a big qualifier, a European game at that stage of the season because it was just starting to get dark. The floodlights were on. It was live on the BBC. We beat them two nothing. The place is going crazy, you know. And it was all about. Rangers are back, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll bloody the nose of the top flight clubs just to remind you what we are, we'll be back soon in the, the top flight. And it had that European feel about it. And then we played Motherwell again. We were losing to Motherwell in the top flight last week. Don't worry about that, because every time we lose to Motherwell in the top flight, we win the top flight. But <laughs> the playoff to get into the top flight, our first attempt at getting out of the uh, the second tier of Scottish football 2015 with that massive playoff tie, Motherwell destroyed us over the two legs. We beat us 3-1 in the first leg at, at Ibrox. But that night, midweek, it's still light because it's deep into spring. It felt like a European semi-final and it felt more tense and a bigger deal and a better atmosphere than uh, the game against Fiorentina in the UEFA Cup semi-final. Just, uh, what was that, kind of eight years, six years beforehand, seven years beforehand. So it, was, it felt like a European... And I realised it's not about Europe. It's just about the, what is the next big thing? What's the next big thing you've got to move on to? It's something will feel momentous because it's you know it's taking you out of your normal self, taking you out of your routine, whatever the domestic situation is, and that's what we had 
playing top flight teams when Rangers were a lower league team and a couple of times it was Motherwell and trying to get back into that top flight. And we get back into the Europa League, but it was absolutely a hum humiliation, the worst result of my life when we lost to Progress Niedercorn and then Gerard arrives. A man who won the Champions League and the Europa League as a player and scored in both of those finals when his team Liverpool was winning them, famously didn't win the league as a player and here he was coming to Scotland with Rangers and he was going to use the Europa League, he was going to use Europe, do better in that first, to finance and to, to inspire us to getting back to the top domestically. And he works a miracle. Considering what had happened against Progress near the con, the following season he works a miracle, which would have been a miracle anyway to get through four qualifying rounds and get us into group stage. And we don't, we finished third, but I know a, a very respectable third in that group, we were just glad to be in the group stage. Fantastic. Following season, we finished second. Gets through the qualifying rounds again, we finish second and we qualify. The following season, uh, he finishes first. We don't lose a single game in our Europa League group stage and we don't lose a single game in the SPFL Premiership and we win that as well. And Stephen Gerrard has, he just put it like a cloak round about as the Europa League. Um, it's We paid into it and it paid us back and the reason we are back to being ourselves domestically winning league titles, winning the League Cup, winning the Scottish Cup is because of what we got from the Europa League. It's not just we're being a bit biased and we're trying to make out it's better than the Champions League. It's not that we think we're more interested and we're more interested in European football. It is for me like it's like a trophy to win, to win a group stage for a, a Scottish team. The way the coefficient is just now in Europe is like a, it's better than the League Cup, it's better than the Scottish Cup. For Rangers to get to the Europa League final and to lose it on penalties is 10 times the value of us winning a, the Scottish League title, the top league title. Uh, the Europa League has been so good to us and I love it so much. It, the Europa League is why we are, why we are back, you know, top of the league right now. Uh, is, is, is through the Europa League. I lost a lot of respect for Steven Gerrard when he went to Saudi Arabia. I really did, um, but I'd no, I'd, I'd no qualms with him going to Aston Villa. I knew that was going to happen. You look at what they're doing just now, uh, money-wise. But I lost a lot of respect when we went to Saudi Arabia, but I'll be forever grateful for him for what he did. He set us up in the path we're on just now, and I love this tournament. If we, both the Prague teams get scudded tonight, and that's good, because if we do get through at the quarterfinals, I want it, you know, basically disinfected of racist scumbags. So Slavia... They lost by two goals in the San Siro, so hopefully Milano finish the, the job in Prague. Sparta Prague, they're toast, they're gone. Um, Liverpool beat them 5-1 in their home patch tonight. That means, uh, uh, I nearly said Rangers instead of Scotland, and that's that's no really the slip of the tongue you think it is. The coefficient, Scotland's coefficient is deadlocked, I think, with, with the Czech Republic's right now. So if we do manage to go through next week, yet again, we will keep Scotland's Champions League, automatic qualification for the Champions League, for our champions, the Scottish champions. Uh, going a bit longer and, and hopefully this time we will get to reap the benefit of that um, but but basically this whole country the people are talking about oh maybe we should put we should park European football this season so we can concentrate on winning what the stinking smelly Scottish Premiership uh, where every team absolutely despises us and we despise every other team or the, the, the stinking old Scottish Cup we're going to Hibs at Easter where do they throw fucking you know, Buckfast bottles at us and stuff like that. They're throwing uh, court screws at, at Lauren Shankland. Like, I don't want to go. Yeah, that's not what we're all about. Let's go and breathe that rarefied, purer air of European football, as I say, and let and let the, the rest of the continent notice us. And it was beautiful tonight to go and bloody the nose of Benfica. Even if we don't go through next week, and there's a real possibility of that still, we've... We've represented again, and it's been just—it's great fun. It's a prize in itself playing these kind of clubs in this kind of tournament at this kind of stage. Uh, I was hoping for a book ending. You know, I, I keep—I'm so ghettoized by the, the Rangers. I grew up, I grew up with you know doing well in Europe once every decade, basically. That I keep thinking there's no way we're ever going to get back to another European final. That was it, you know, Seville. That was it um, for at least a decade. So I just want us to exit nicely and we can say that that little, that little kind of aberration we had last season in the Champions League and the aberration we've had this season in the Europa League, losing to Aris Limas all drawn with them at home um, and you know also getting pumped by PSV Eindhoven in the Champions League playoff round, 
we've parked that with the result against the, the both results against Sparta Prague, but also the result against the two results against Real Betis, and then tonight a really respectable. For, I was quite I'm quite happy with that that we can bow it because I feel as if this, this has got to be bookended. This period has got to come to an end. Uh, but it doesn't have to come to an end. And next Thursday night, I'll certainly be shouting my lungs out to make sure it doesn't. Our manager it, has got us really excited. And it is really exciting just now, in good and bad ways. We kept that exciting tonight by keeping Benfica at bay. We've also kept the league a bit exciting where we could have been five points clear last weekend. Um, we're going to play Hibs at Easter. I don't know what kind of team we're going to field there. But it's like we're on a bus, the big baldy Belgians bus, and we know the road we're driving, but it's one of those roads with lots of blind corners and we don't know what's coming round the bend. Um, we're going in the right direction, but we don't know what else we're going to face. Uh, nothing's nothing's really safe, and it's exciting that we're going in the right direction, but uh, there's a lot of twists and turns to go. Yeah, that's more than enough from me, folks. Uh, tonight, it won't be Vic and Bob. It will be Craig and Rob talking about Benfica. Ka, ka. Um, they'll be not they'll not be shooting any stars because our stars just played with their heart on their sleeve. I'm sorry, but their ball's out. They pedal to the metal, and at Iberian rain running down the, the blue crest on that white away kit with the, the pinstripes which is a, a reprise of the kit we wore when we played Porto for the first time in Europe in 1982 no it's a 1983-84 season and they beat us in away goals and that is the only time so far and this is our 12th tie in Europe against Portuguese opposition that's the only time they've, the Portuguese have put us out what a record we've got what a performance that was and what a pod the boys will have for you at 9pm tonight, folks. Thanks for your time.